All right, this is Good Friday. Matter of fact, the crosswalk starts in about an hour and 20 minutes uh, this morning at uh, 10 o'clock. They do that um, and uh, will conclude around 1230. So keeping in the theme of this time of year, I have selected introductions for all of you based on this time of year. And when I think of this time of the year as a kid, I think of that great show with Peter Cottontail. (laughs) (laughs) Therefore... All of your intros this morning will be done with the theme of Peter Cottontail in the background, <laughs> and will be some type of Easter theme done in the same uh, stanza rhymes as Peter Cottontail. So you'll have A A B C C B in terms of your rhyming. The first and second lines will rhyme, the third and sixth and the fourth and fifth. So This is impressive. Without is any really further ado. I, I'm totally lost, Larry. <laughs> yeah, this sounds like a ninth grade English. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Here we go. All right. Here comes Delegate Michael Height. Bring in takes from the right, but with just a touch of moderate stock. He took Hanshaw's side and made his deal, making the enemy of the man of steel. Now those two never ever talk. <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> All right, I can sing less if you like. <laughs> no, please. No, it's <laughs> great. <laughs> I just like the Ferretti laughs in the background. <laughs> Hey, who's that near the stubble field chair? What's that, the man with the silver hair? He is back in his seat and he is live. He's got three weeks of pent up takes. He ain't talking no deep, steep fakes. Welcome back, Michael Carl, to the Friday Five. Thank you. Great to be here. (laughs) You're welcome, sir. (laughs) Trump claims he's got a Trump hating judge, and his Trump hating family will not budge. Trump's attorney is certainly going to have to work. Like Hillary Melania is now the cheated on spouse. I bet she's sleeping in a separate house. Hey, Larry Schultz, Melania could be the next senator from New York. <laughs> it's great to be here, and nothing would surprise me. <laughs> it's a good week to be an attorney named Joe. The one named Freddy is on his show, but there's another out there who's gotten on TV, too. Joe Tacopina works for President Trump, and you work for him, you take your lumps. Hey, Joe Freddy, Joe Tacopina has an even tougher job than you. <laughs> uh, I'm Rob, I, Rob, I, I gotta say, yes. Uh, when I'm with some buddies down here, I, I tell them I do a radio show on Friday, and and they're impressed. And and I, you know, they're always asking me, hey, how can I listen in? I'd like to hear what the show's about. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't give them the information for this week. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I still need to tune in about 8.45 at the earliest. Uh, Rob, you'll like this. Uh, Damon Wright says you have a voice like Sinatra. (laughs) (laughs) Dave Dave Sinatra, the mechanic around the corner. Yeah, no, we dug him up today. (laughs) And and, and I hope the camera catches Rob weaving back and forth. He's getting into the singing. (laughs) Absolutely. I'd like to help us. Yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, and finally, <clears throat> here comes Billy Stubblefield, <laughs> hopping down the civility trail, <laughs> hippity hoppity compromises on the way. He weighs both sides of every debate, be you good or reprobate. And this week he had his 83rd birthday. Yay. Happy Yay. birthday. Yay. <laughs> Happy birthday, Billy. <laughs> that was good, Rob. No, it was something. Was good, yeah. <laughs> now, and I disagree with you, Joe. I think today would have been a wonderful time to give your, your buddies oh, the, yeah. the notice. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Lord. And <laughs> yes, because it's Easter, Joe. That's it's a very a, good uh, yeah. take. Uh, and you, you lead off, as always, Mr. Ferretti. And I might point out that the Pirates, fresh off a sweep of the Boston Red Sox, are 4-2 and two and in second place by one game, well ahead of Mr. Carl's last place St. Louis Cardinals. Yeah, and we're starting our rally this today <laughs> against the first-place Brewers. I'm uh, positioning MLB to end the season after six games this year. Uh, Mr. Ferretti, you're up. Yeah, pardon me if I don't cover the Pirates this morning, Rob. Um, I, I, I do want to, I guess, continue to theme this morning uh, on the heels of J.B. McCuskey. Did you want uh, me to start, start the Peter Cottontail music? Is that what you meant, Bill? No, 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 no. no. I mean, no, Joe? Uh, no, we can refrain from that, I hope. Uh, 
But I, I do want to continue the theme here because uh, we had a big announcement uh, statewide this week with uh, Attorney General Morrissey announcing that he has chosen the governor's seat as the office he's going to run for. I think that was uh, uh, calculated in many respects. Uh, it's one he thinks he can win because apparently uh, this is a signal that Justice, Governor Justice is going to throw his hat in the ring for the U.S. Senate seat. Uh, so the jockeying has uh, already commenced, and I think the races are shaping up to the point where we can start looking at who are the favorites and who has an uphill climb to try to win. And the polling that has come out, uh, no surprise, uh, it was correlated with this announcement, was that uh, in the governor's race, if Morrissey uh, is now considered uh, the candidate, uh, and we consider all the others who have announced, Morrissey is a big favorite, and he's a big favorite because he has statewide recognition, number one. And number two, he is going to have a lot of money. Uh, the Club for Growth, uh, that uh, PAC, the biggest PAC in the country, has committed $10 million to the Morrissey campaign, in addition to the millions Morrissey already has on hand. So uh, his position in this race for governor looks to be pretty secure, both based on polling and based on money. And for the U.S. Senate seat, uh, Governor Justice is polling way ahead of uh, Congressman Mooney, uh, almost two to one. And concerning for Congressman Mooney was that a third of the poll respondents really didn't know who he was in the state of West Virginia, whereas we know the governor has a outsized uh, uh, reputation across the state. So I wonder if these two important races are already setting up to where we have prohibitive favorites and the entertainment we're hoping to get in tight races is not going to be there for us, uh, those of us who are, are political junkies. I don't see the drama that may, uh, we were hoping for in these races. I'm wondering how others feel about that. All right, let's start with the Admiral, Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, Joe, I, uh, I've been struck by the fact that we have a rich field running for governor, but only one has really come out swinging and being aggressive in his campaign, and that's Patrick Marcy. Uh, Mac Warner uh, made his announcement fairly low-key. Uh, J.B. Mikulski, his low-key. Same thing with Chris Miller. Uh, it's only... Uh, uh, it's only Marcy that has come out, I think, in a very aggressive pos posture. Uh, also, I think if you look at the geographic breakdown, uh, Marcy is making a big to-do that he represents the northern part of the state. Well, Mac Warner is part of that as well with the northern panhandle, whereas the others are in the southern part of the state. Uh, I, uh, I think, like in most cases, uh, 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 money is going to... Have play a big factor, and the fact that Marcy has statewide recognition, he has money, uh, he's uh, he's he by his job he represents the whole state. Uh, I suspect Marcy right now is a prohibitive favorite. Uh, we'll see what happens. I would like to see somewhere uh, we get to the point of looking at the the various merits of the candidates. Uh, whether we get to that stage or not, I don't know. I think right now it's going to be all all PR. Uh, as far as the uh, Senate race, I think if uh, Justice jumps in, uh, it's he is a prohibitive favorite. I don't see anybody that taking him on, including the incumbent senator. You don't see anybody taking him on. You mean successfully? Successfully, successfully, yes. All right, Mike Carl. Well, I, <clears throat> I agree with uh, everything that's been said so far. Uh, Morrissey clearly is the strong leader in the gubernatorial race. And I, I, I think, uh, and, and because of the justice w issue, which are factor, which uh, is a separate issue I wanted to talk about later, uh, is uh, then that's, that's getting uh, Senator Manchin, to, uh, but those two factors are making it look like more and more he, he, he's going to, his best shot is, <laughs> and this is incredible, is to try, you know, a run for president. So, Interesting. 
Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, uh, the justice. I, I, I'd love to see. I mean, I, I wouldn't lose interest in the in the election if it was uh, justice against Manchin for U.S. Senate. That would be fascinating. That would be very fascinating. Larry Schultz? Um, I think uh, as far as Governor Justice goes, one bit of advice I would give him is to uh, take baby dog to the vet right now and release a long, detailed report about baby dog's health. Because without baby dog, it's a much different deal. And so I would, I would uh, even if... You know, you could get a veterinarian who maybe wouldn't be 100% truthful if there are some problems. <laughs> Not that I know of any. Uh, we want we want a, a strong health report for baby dog uh, going into this race. Um, it's going to be a difficult thing. I believe that if, if Joe Manchin's best shot is to run for president, <clears throat> that's not very good. I don't think Joe Manchin has the money, first of all nor will he draw the money from the um, people who generally pay a lot of money to fund presidential campaigns. And so I don't see that as being the issue. Um, I do think he could beat Jim Justice straight up. Um, But again, the health of baby dog is the crucial issue. (laughs) So if I understand your take correctly, Larry, you're advocating that the governor bribe a a veterinarian to... (laughs) If necessary. Conduct a phony <laughs> medical report on the state dog. Right. Uh, uh, if necessary. If it may ne- not be necessary. <laughs> not necessary. The, the, if necessary. The, the dog looks like the picture of health to me. Sure. I mean, but you're not a God knows doctor. we've all had an opportunity to examine every aspect of the dog, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Um, you know, once the Bette Midler thing happened, uh, yes. we, we pretty much had every bit of information we could possibly get as just viewers. So, yeah, I think there's that one extra step he has to take. Mr. Height. So I went to um, I went to Morrissey's announcement the other day, and one of the things that, that struck me was he – he contrasted himself against some other uh, people in the field um, in a way that was very important, I thought, that y- you have uh, a more Capito and a Chris Miller and um, even a J.B. McCuskey who um, come from political families and uh, almost have been raised for these positions, groomed for for running for governor, if you will. And he made a very important distinction is, is that he wasn't. He came from humble beginnings and has had to really work hard to get where he is right now. And I think that kind of message will resonate with most West Virginians. Um, so if, if he can continue with that message, he already has a lead. Um, I think it'll just grow more and more. Um, and, and and he should be, uh, barring anything cat- catastrophic happening, should be uh, the nominee. The other race that that is, is very interesting, and, and Joe, you said there's not a whole lot of drama in it. I think there will be. The mudslinging has not started in the Mooney um, Jim Justice race, and there is plenty of fodder to be slung in that race um so hold on to your hat um when when big jim announces um and i'm pretty sure he will um i'm sure that the mooney camp has already started gathering what their message is going to be and and the the mudslinging that's going to start um and i expect that one to be very heated um and i expect it to get a whole lot closer before um, it comes time to, to cast your vote. Back to you, Joe. Well, Mike Height, that's an important point uh, about the Mooney justice race that is shaping up because the Club for Growth has also committed $10 million for the Mooney campaign. And the battle lines there are Club for Growth versus Mitch McConnell because Mitch McConnell reportedly has been squarely in the governor justice camp is committing money from the Republican uh, Senate folks to that campaign. He's imploring the justice, uh, the justice announced for the Senate seat. And so that's going to be, you're right, that, that could shape up to be an interesting battle. I just don't know how 
Congressman Mooney is going to overcome the fact that Governor Justice is, by all accounts, a very popular governor, still running in that 60 to 70 percent favorability rating statewide. That's really a daunting task for Mooney. But he'll have the money to do it, and uh, I suspect he'll have to sling mud to be effective in the race against the governor. But for uh, I'm sorry for the Senate seat, but for the governor's race, uh, I, I'm I listened to J.B. McCuskey. Great message. He has a unique ability to talk about uh, issues that really hit home for West Virginians, as opposed to Republican Party talking points. But uh, I'm afraid that uh, these other candidates for governor are going to be swamped by the money that Morsi's going to have at hand. And uh, I, I don't know how much of a fair fight that's going to be. Morsi also touts his track record, which he does very effectively. So uh, perhaps, yeah, less drama in that race than for the U.S. Senate. I think from Mooney's perspective, I don't think he needs to sling mud. I think he just needs to state facts, which he will. In looking at the governor, you've got the half a billion dollar tax increase at the very beginning of the administration when he was a Democrat. You don't think Mooney's going to seize on that? That's all facts. You've got the governor who has recently had his wages garnished. We just talked about that with J.B. McCuskey. That's a fact. That's not mudslinging. That's a fact. You've got the governor with a list of creditors who are waiting to be paid or may never. That's Those are facts. That's not mudslinging. Those, that's bringing up facts, right? You've, you've got uh, the money that was diverted to the Marshall baseball field. Now, while that may play around Marshall University with the alums, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, I don't know. It certainly isn't going to get him any votes out of the prison system, right? Uh, there's a lot of factual stuff there that's going to get sent out. Now, on Justice's side, all he's got to do is say, well, there's ethics violations involving this person here who wasn't born in West Virginia, right? He just, he just came here after he left Maryland and... and you know, he's not one of us. You're going to hear that. that can, that's for sure. These are all facts. I can see that argument boiling down to Mooney saying justice doesn't pay his bills and justice saying Mooney pays his bills with campaign funds. <laughs> <laughs> and he could say, at least I pay I'm my bills. Waiting, yeah, I'm waiting for that moment, actually. Yeah, I think there's a lot of good stuff there. I think this is going to be a, a race where uh, you're going to uh, – what, what, where do we recycle the paper around here, Bill? Quad graphics. Quad graphics. Quad yeah. graphics will be overflowing with a lot of campaign <laughs> literature that's going to be in mailboxes every day, every single day. Yay. And, and yes. the, the governor's race, you know, remember, Morrissey almost beat Manchin. He only lost by 3%, right? And Joe only got 50% of the vote that election. So mm-hmm. Moore's elect, Morrissey's electability is not in doubt in this particular case. But that is uh, that is a heck of a field in and. In, in, the point was made earlier, I think, by Bill about how quiet the rest of that field has been to this point. And it's a long way till primary election day, still more than a year. But it has been remarkably quiet, exactly hasn't it? Right. With exception of Marcy. And, e- and even then, yeah. Patrick's most effective communication before this was hinting yeah. about a race that, that was to come, exactly, yeah. starting back in December. And also the poll that, that Joe referred to earlier, uh, that poll does show that Marcy is uh, much more popular than the other candidates. But that poll was commissioned by a, the, a principal backer of Patrick Marcy. So you had to look at that poll with a little bit of a, um, a, a question yeah. mark. So, that's yeah. fair. Who, who's the prominent Democrat that will emerge as the candidate for governor? That's the, the question. The, the, those words are incompatible. They may be now in West Virginia. <laughs> they may be. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> who is the prominent? The, who, who? The, the mayor of Huntington, I think, and I'm growing a blank on his name now. No, that's the point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I, I don't, that's another end of the state, Mike. <laughs> but, but even so, it's, it, there, is, there is no name that jumps to mind. Larry Schultz? I, I don't know of um, anyone who's uh, getting ready to step out. They're going to need a bunch of money. I don't think that the National Democratic Party is going to spend a ton mm-hmm. uh, in an 88 to 12 legislative state. For now. Um, for now. Could and, get worse. Um, it could. Not much. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, when you're more, um, when, you're, when your legislature is more dominated by Republicans than Tennessee's, then, uh, yeah, you've, uh, you've got an uphill climb uh, in a governor's race. We need to do our uh, 9 o'clock break here. And when we come back, Admiral, you're on the clock. Mr. Ferretti, thank you for getting us started once again. Okay. Remain on hold and tell your friends it's safe to listen now.
<laughs> Friday crew intact with the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Billy. Thank you, Rob. Uh, oh, no, no. We go around the room with the introductions first, Bill. Then you go. Well, then you're saying good morning. I'm just saying good morning. I've only been doing this a couple of weeks. <laughs> I know you're riding high on that 83rd birthday, but yeah, you calm it down a little bit. Plus, Bring it down. I, you get to the point you can't remember things, Rob, and I'm at that stage now. And at 83, you can't wait any longer. <laughs> you go. No yeah, minutes hurry up, to wait. Hurry up, hurry up, Rob. <laughs> the Sarge Delegate Mike Heights. Good morning. And he is the senior fellow to the Tuscarora Institute, Michael Carl. Yeah, and at 76, my memory's already slipped. <laughs> <laughs> Attorney at law, Larry Schultz. Glad to be here. And via telephone, Joseph Joey Torts for ready. Uh, Joe, good morning to you, sir. Good morning, everybody. There was a pause there for a moment. I was afraid we lost you. Now, yep, Mr. I am still here. Okay. Mr. Stubblefield, you may now. I, I want to be sure Take I'm not getting two. premature. Are you telling me it's okay to go ahead? <laughs> you can be immature, just never premature. <laughs> okay. Right yeah. answer. Okay. Uh, this past week, a lot has happened. We've... Uh, uh, We've had the indictment of uh, President Trump. Uh, we had the Tennessee uh, uh, expelling three of the, the members. Uh, we had Clarence Thomas, uh, and the list goes on. Uh, I think there's something that kind of common with all of those, and that is our political systems the way it's set up now uh, from our early days we've had a two-party system uh, uh, we had the federalists and the republican democrats uh, in the Tom, uh, george washington thomas jefferson days uh, the in the we had the whigs breaking off from the uh, the, the democrats so it's we've had the two-party system but my question is today who are these two parties serving are they serving themselves or serving, uh, or serving the uh, the public as a whole, uh, we the polls would suggest we have probably seven to eight or nine percent of the extremists on both parties, and through our primary system, they tend to influence greatly who's going to be elected uh, and the result is we're getting more and more to the extreme uh, in our representatives we don't have the middle anymore uh, we we've lost the middle and neither side is willing to compromise also both sides tend to paint the other ones not only to disagree with them they paint the other side as evil. Uh, and uh, it's. I think that with this polarization, I question the fact, does the two-party system service as well today as what it has historically? That's two, my question. Two-party system and its functionality at the moment. Let's start on the phone with Joe. Joey Torts for ready. Well, uh, I'm not surprised to hear this topic, Bill, coming from uh, the leader of the Stubblefield Institute. And, uh, yeah, we can certainly find lots to criticize with regard to the two-party system. However, a cautionary note, as the races shape up for 2024, be very wary of third-party candidacies and third-party groups touting that they're trying to bridge the gap between these two parties and satisfy the middle of the country because I suspect there's going to be some nefarious groups coming forward touting themselves as third parties who are actually designed and, in fact, funded by one or two of these parties uh, to upset the election of 2024 and game it in such a way that one of the two uh party candidates, either Republican or Democrat, wins the Electoral College. So uh, this is, to me, this is going to be a dangerous time. And I think we're going to have to be very clear in terms of defining who these people are, where their money's coming from, and whether they are truly a third party uh, trying to stake out middle ground, or whether they're really involved to uh, really affect the election and get one of the two candidates from the major parties elected. Uh, I, I, you can see that happening. There's some reporting on it. And I, I just, uh, I'm fearful that it's going to be a wolf in sheep's clothing uh, when it comes to a third party candidacy in 2024. So I hope a, a legitimate group arises, but I'm fearful that it may not. 
Michael Height. Uh, you know, you say we have a two-party system, but I don't know that that's true. A third party could rise up and 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 get enough votes to to be relevant, and then you could say then we have a three-party system. So, I I think what has happened up till now is there hasn't been a party that's had the platform and the message to draw enough people to it uh, to really contend with the other two parties. I used to think that the Libertarian Party could do that if they could ever get away from the the cannabis message that they, they tout all the time. And I think that's a, a losing issue for them if they would get away from it. I think a lot of their platform has merit and, and could really do a lot of damage uh, to the other two parties. Um, but they have to get away from the cannabis message. Um, with respect, I mean, it has to do with races as well, because not all races um, are run the same. And what I mean is, is position. So if you look at just the, the presidential candidates, the way that presidents are nominated um, is by the primaries. And because we don't have primaries on the same day, um, you tell me, when is the last time West Virginia has decided or really been relevant in deciding who the presidential nominee is going to be in either party? So you have 1960. Well, right. And that's, that's and, a while back. Yeah. Right. And that's that, that's a great point that that we, we there's no relevance and we're not the last ones on the list either. So the states that come after us are even more irrelevant than we are. So I think in order to for us all to be relevant, I think that's a really bad system in the way we choose um, that, especially that presidential nominee, and we need to get away from that as well. Um, I don't know that the fringes have a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of sway in primaries. I think it's more in the general. They may. All right, that wasn't a bad take at all, Mr. Schultz. Yeah, I I think there's a chance. You know. W- it's not that long ago. It's not back to 1960 when Ross Perot decided a presidential election. Um, but it's not going to be in the primaries. Um, there's not any way for a third party to come in and actually affect that race. But in the general elections, especially when one party or the other has lost the popular vote in a number of elections right in a row for several times, there's always a temptation for that party to say let's get some people uh who are a third party like joe's saying in here and uh uh on the democratic side or taking democratic votes so that our 47 percent becomes the winner and that's always an incentive if one party or the other has lost a number of presidentials in a row uh, on the straight up vote count um, the Electoral College will save you sometimes, uh, as Donald Trump found, but it's not going to save you every time, and once that margin gets too big, it's over. So to take what Joe was saying, um, I, I look for the, the certain elements that would usually be Republican elements in this next election, um, perhaps quietly funding somebody who claims to be uh, a moderate Democrat, and I didn't leave the party, the party left me, and they're all left-wingers now, and I'm a moderate, and, and hoping to get that 10% of the vote on general election day, that will allow a Republican with less than 50% to win it straight up. Larry's nice so. of you to state facts about the, your own party, finally. We all appreciated that admission. No, it, it was I was mocking the Republican line. I didn't get that. I, thought, I, I didn't get it that way, Mike. I well, thought he was be, actually confessing. That's because I was being generous. <laughs> I thought he was confessing, Joe. What do you think? Yeah. Mr. Mr. Carl, go right ahead. Uh, well, every, so far we've been talking about process, and you know, that the process is necessary to enable underlying principles to be manifested and uh it's very it, it's obviously the process is very convoluted and subject to manipulation but i i, I still think that there's uh, a, a, a separation of, of underlying principles at the individual level and that is the people who 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 believe in uh 
freedom, free enterprise, uh, uh, work hard and earn a good living, and encouraging uh, uh, economic risk-taking and discouraging government control. And then there's the ones that believe in government control. And I, I think I think that's still the fundamental uh, difference in principle. But it, 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 everybody's right. It's gonna it's gonna be a quite a quite a game. That and 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 remember, we still have the electoral college system to to, to manifest the final election of the president. And uh, I know there's some people that are against that, but uh, that's their problem. But but uh, you know, I I there were. Tens of millions of uh, people who would, you know, were former or had been Democrats or registered Democrats who voted for Republicans, or tens of millions who who actually were were were. I mean, this is the you know my my posse spin from my narrow perspective. Uh, I mean, his, Hispanic heritage folks, African American folks. And 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 uh, you know union you know blue collar folks uh, switching over and that's encouraging to me as a Republican. Bill, I'll give you my take on this before I go back to Please. you. Is I I think in uh, my children's lifetimes I think there'll be a third party, a fourth party, a fifth party. I think this generation coming up. They're used to disruptors and disruptions. They don't accept the status quo on anything, and they won't going forward. They're becoming increasingly dissatisfied with the current two-party system we have on both sides. And if you look at the way this group does business, they do it over social media. You can rally millions of people in a very short period of time with just a few words, whatever platform it is that you want to use to send it out there. And in, in, uh, in their lifetimes... The way we do business now will be obsolete politically. It'll take some time, and it'll be a lot of disruption, but it will happen in our our children's lifetimes. Uh, and, the, and the other thing is, uh, this group coming through right now, they don't have the same loyalties that we had when we were kids. That's not there. Their, their loyalties are, are much different than, uh, than maybe the way that uh, you remember when you were a kid. And as a result of that, I don't think they feel they owe anybody older to them anything. And a- anything, yeah. right? And I'm, I'm talking in, in general, right? I'm not I'm talking about their attitude toward their own parents. But I think in terms of the way the power structure is currently set up, I think it's it's uh, it's open season when it comes uh, to these people getting a little older and into the system and working their way up through. Bill, back to you. Yeah, I agree with you, Rob. I think there will be a change, but I also agree with Joe because he made a very telling point earlier. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen in 2024 for the simple reason there is so much fear on both sides of the of the other opponent. The Democrats are petrified that Trump could be reelected as president. The Republicans are petrified that Biden's going to be reelected. There's more fear, I think, on both sides than what we normally have. So I don't think there's going to be anything done with a third party that would bias the election toward the other side. So this particular case, I don't think you're going to see a real movement in 2024, but I do think there will be something in future years issue number three larry schultz um i'm going to say this uh uh believing that uh some some of my other colleagues here are going to bring up the indictment of trump which i really would like to talk about uh but a fascinating thing for me as a as a civil attorney is the trial judge granted plaintiffs uh dominion voting system summary judgment on liability actual malice uh, claims in the defamation case against Fox. And what that means is the judge reached out, and this is perfectly within the rules when it's merited, and said to the plaintiff who bears the burden of proof, there's not a way that they could possibly, reasonable minds could not differ that they told a falsehood that damaged a reputation and they did it with actual malice. All that is off the table for the coming trial. So that the only thing that's left is going to be the amount of damages, if they were damaged and how much. 
And because of that, um, it, it, you know, in 37 years of practicing plaintiffs as a plaintiff's lawyer, that's happened once in my career. Um, and in fact, that judge went the extra step and gave us the money too, um, which uh, resulted in an appeal to the state Supreme Court. It wasn't a defamation case. And uh, one that where the Supreme Court agreed. There was no way to argue this differently in a reasonable uh, manner within the law. So we won. Very rare. I mean, I can remember walking around for a long time after that wondering, what has happened here? You know, I never even had thought about actually winning the summary judgment. You file them and you, you sometimes that'll change the way the judge does things. But um, in this case, that's a very big win. Fox is in deep, deep trouble. And when one of the things they will do at this trial, if the punitive damages are on the table, and by the way, Delaware state law, where the Delaware court is sitting, there are no caps on punitive damages, meaning that whatever the jury says the amount is, there's really no, uh, they're, they're not going to take it. I don't think they're going to take it away from them. At the trial, Fox's assets will be laid before the jury. Here's how much money this company has. And so when you set the punishment level on punitive damages, you, you need to decide based on their total assets what portion ought to go to Dominion Voting Systems to ensure Fox won't do this again to somebody. That, if I were a Fox shareholder, would make me terrified uh, because th th there is not going to be any room for arguing for sort of a, well, it's not really as bad as, as they've put it. When you're litigating the actual liability, then that can hurt the damages claim, even though they're supposed to be separate. But there's not going to be any of that now. They're not litigating that now. They can't go in and say, well, it was all true, which I'll be kind of thankful for, actually, because I got a little tired of hearing people say that. And so that part's over. Should be a fascinating case, and it's not too far off. Uh, I don't think the trial's too far off. What is your question for the group to ponder, Larry? Because <laughs> for, for, for the, well, for the group to ponder is, do you think that in this setting, Fox is going to get crippled and, I'm, and, and, and ruined? Um, I mean, they have successors, Newsmax and OAN, I'm sure are out there rubbing their hands together about the advertisers they'll get if Fox goes broke. On the other hand, Rupert Murdoch can keep feeding money into Fox almost indefinitely. So will will they be damaged by this such that they can't survive or they survive as a much lesser thing? I don't think I've ever seen one of our panelists happier or giddier as they presented their question than Larry right now. <laughs> Joe Ferretti, you go first. Well, I, I, two, two uh, reactions I have. First of all, it's refreshing that the uh, leaders at Fox are not running to the microphone and claiming this is a Fox-hating judge and the judge is corrupt and, <laughs> and all that. Uh, I, I, I like the fact that they're res they at least respect uh, the actions of the court. Now, they'll respond accordingly, and this is going to set up the mother of all appeals because uh, the law is pretty clear that uh, we typically, in jurisprudence, favor the resolution of disputes by the jury as opposed to judge. But in this particular case, as Larry explained, the judge has looked at the evidence and, and has basically said there's no way the plaintiffs are going to lose in their defamation case against Fox. And it's, that's the judge's prerogative under the civil rules. Uh, Mike Carl's law firm has been the beneficiary on the defense side of many summary judgment uh, rulings by the court uh, where the judge finds that the plaintiff can't possibly meet their burden of proof to prove their case. But this is this is the opposite of that. With the judge saying there's no way the plaintiff can lose, the evidence is so compelling to support the claim for defamation. So my first reaction is, okay, I, I respect what's going on with the court. And secondly, uh, not since New York Times versus Sullivan, which is a U.S. Supreme Court, uh, opinion on defamation as, as 50 years old. It has been the guiding principle in terms of defamation cases for decades. 
Not since that case was decided uh, have we had such an important case come down in, in courts uh, to offer even further uh, explanations and, and guidelines for defamation cases, in this case involving the media. And I think what these media companies are going to have to decide as a result of this case, either you are a, new, are a news organization or you're not. And I think that is something that we need desperately in media. Either you give us the news or you give us opinion, but you don't do both. And uh, I think for all media companies, that'll be the message that comes from this case. And that's a great point, Joe, because for those of us of this generation, we you grew up watching the, you know, the network news and you believed you were watching news. And that's changed over the last... <laughs> 30 years or whatever, and, and maybe they won't make them have a distinction, but maybe they will make sure that the distinction is made clear by the people who are on a set that what I'm telling you right now isn't news, it's opinion. All right, I'm going to keep it in the attorneys here and go to Mike Carl. Well, uh, the one major point that I would raise is that in a case involving you know, this level of, of uh, technology and this scale, dollar amount of the damages cannot be part of summary judgment that is beyond uh, reversal on appeal. Uh, the, 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 the fact of, of punitive damages, you know, understand the rules, but the amount of actual economic damages in something like this, it cannot be legitimately determined by the judge himself. So that, that's my only push back on so they will have a trial on damages yeah pretty darn sure and uh, I, I even i would agree that i don't think he can put the damages number on yeah there right and right. make the whole thing go away right so so yeah. so and and the range of that can be pretty big oh. yeah but but i think murdoch can absorb and push back and keep keep going michael heights so my first opinion is that um the 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 plaintiff should have to show damages and be able to explain what those damages are and that should be irrelevant to the assets of the defendant uh, i don't know why the assets of the defendant have anything to do with it you're not there to damage the defendant you're there to collect the damages if they've caused damage so whatever those damages are i can assure you as the number one cable news network Fox can absorb whatever the damages are going to be if they're found guilty. I don't know that this will affect Fox as a whole. If this had been MSNBC, maybe, um, because they're one of the lesser cable news networks. Um, but Fox is is the giant in the room, um, and I really don't think this is going to affect them greatly uh, one way or the other. The law agrees with what you said. In other words... On the question of damages, Fox will have to, or Dominion will have to prove actual damages, loss of money, loss of sales, et cetera, et cetera. Um, however, when you get to punitive damages, which are not capped by the state, those are designed to punish the defendant, to say, okay, what you did was outrageous and beyond the pale. And we're going to make sure it's very expensive so you don't ever do ever think of doing anything like this again. So it, it is two different kinds of damages. And the second part, the punitives, are about harming Fox. Sure. <laughs> I, I agree with you. But I also think that no matter what the result comes back, this will be appealed. Fox is going to appeal this. Sure. And, and I would guess, I'm not a lawyer, but I would guess that normally when there's an appeal, there's some kind of lesser judgment that, that comes out. There's there's an agreement to the numbers. Sometimes. And sometimes even without trying the case, they won't reach that sort of arrangement. Correct. This makes that more expensive for Fox to accomplish without a trial. Uh, for sure. Bill? Yeah, Rob, this may surprise you, but I don't have an opinion. But I do have some questions. <laughs> I just don't care. <laughs> I, I, do, I do care, but I don't know enough about it, Mike, to have an opinion one way or the other. Uh, or, Most people don't let that stop. <laughs> <laughs> and it rarely, it rarely stops me as well. That's why I paraphrased uh, paraphrased the way I did. Uh, is this limited to the organization or the individuals are, are subject to be uh, uh, 
uh, found guilty as well. I'm thinking about Murdoch. I'm thinking about Tucker Carlson. I'm thinking about some of the reporters. I don't think their names are in the complaint. Okay. I don't think they are parties. It is Fox News. Okay. And then the second question is, are we beyond the point of a settlement outside of the court? You can always have you a settlement. You can do that anytime. Okay. They could have done it. Five minutes before we walked in here, and this whole conversation would be moot. Is um, an, an appeal would be uh, a, would have, could eventually go to the Supreme Court? Is that correct? Well, that's very interesting because it's a state court case, and it will go to the Delaware Supreme Court. But I know that's not the yeah. one you're talking yeah, about. That's right. Yeah. Uh, then the the power to get this before the states, uh, the United States Supreme Court, uh, is limited. And you really have to have a special set of facts to take that state judgment and subject it to the U.S. Supreme Court. Basically, your argument has to be, this is an abrogation of my constitutional rights or some other deeply held federal uh, right like that. It's a pretty tough call. One, one other point is that in all cases the lawyers are the winners <laughs> oh no question about that yes. there's Amen. a little bit of good news yeah. final word comes back to you larry if you need it <laughs> I, I just wanted to say that i'm glad to see that our system still works well enough that you can be held to account when you get on there for 50 days in a row and tell us lies about the software that Dominion uses and Hugo Chavez and all that other gunk that we were handed, and maybe something good that can come out of this is a warning to everybody in these races that, you know, the truth is kind of a, it's a boundary, and you might want to stay on the actual truth side rather than having Sidney Powell just go out there and say everything uh, that comes in her head uh, like they did. Thank you, Larry. And we'll move on to uh, issue number four after the break, and that will be Mike Heights. The delegate is uh, on the hot seat next. That's and we move on to issue number four right now with Delegate Michael Height. Well, here it is, ladies and gentlemen. The indictment and then arrest of Donald J. Trump um, and the circus that ensued. Um, this seems to be like the uh, the playbook of the Democratic Party right now is you you announce something and let it fester for three or four days and then you present it and then there's just not a whole lot to it. Thirty four counts all about the same thing uh, that we already knew about um, alleged payments to Stormy Daniels um, to, to cover up uh, or hush money or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and and where it was paid from and how that's all questionable should it have been used as campaign finance uh, fees or money or should have been a, a business transaction again it's all alleged at this point but uh, my question is um, is was this just a big circus there seems to be nothing to it um even cnn reporters are, are saying i don't see a whole lot here uh do you expect uh donald j trump to be convicted do you expect the president to be convicted joe ferretti uh yeah in georgia um uh, wrong, wrong new york. case that's that, that's the wrong case We're, let's yeah. let's stick to the case in new york uh, even the most hard-boiled Trump haters, I think, were a little let down by the uh, the indictment uh, being unsealed and read, and and the lack of of uh, of, of real substance to th these charges beyond what we already knew, as you said, Mike. So yeah, I, I don't know. Ultimately, he's going to be convicted because there's going to be uh, a challenge to the indictment. There's going to be a what's called a bill of particulars filed by defense counsel for Trump asking for the prosecutor to come up with more information, more support for these charges, basically asking the prosecutor to produce uh, more evidence uh, and what they have. And then the judge you know, looks at all that and decides, as it did in the Dominion case, whether or not there's enough here to proceed with the prosecution. And I think there's a real question whether uh, the judge will allow that to happen or not. So uh, I think a conviction now uh, is less likely 
than I thought it was before this indictment was released. Uh, there may be technical violations. They, you know, there might be enough to survive judge scrutiny and, and continue with the case. But this is on the slow boat to China because uh, cases in that jurisdiction move very slowly. My gosh, the next hearing is in December, the next scheduled hearing. Right. So I, I don't I don't see this moving very fast. There's going to be other developments involving Trump. And, and I think uh, a lot of folks are turning their eyes to those as opposed to what's going on in New York. Admiral, yeah, I think uh, if I could modify your question a little bit, uh, Mike. Please uh, do. Convicted on what? Convicted on a felony or misdemeanor? And there is a significant difference between the two. From what I hear, uh, the chances of being convicted on a felony is going to be a reach. But a uh, conviction on part of a, a misdemeanor is probably more probable. But what does it mean? It, uh, so nobody's going to really take great exception of a conviction on a misdemeanor. So I, I think that the question to me, my mind, will it reach a felony level and will there be a conviction there? And I don't know, not being a lawyer. Well, there, there's a lot of discussion, and again, not being a lawyer, yeah. I don't know, but I've heard that the misdemeanors uh, have, have, have gone beyond yes. the statute of limitations. So therefore, if they don't refer back to the felony conviction if you can't get the felony yeah. conviction i don't know that you can get the the misdemeanor uh, on on technical aspects i've heard the same thing and let me take uh your when you f f uh presented the case it was a little bit uh it's a continuation of the democrats i think and i think the democrats are probably less happy about this than some of the Republicans. The Democrats view this as an, they had an opportunity in other jurisdictions, Georgia and the, uh, uh, the classified. So the Democrats are not happy that they, uh, they indicted Trump. On I agree, terms. but I think the Democrats were really happy last Thursday and Friday when they heard that, that President Trump was indicted and, and the anticipation for what was going to be revealed on Tuesday was beyond measure. And then it became a dud. And now the Democrats are not real happy because there was no substance to what was revealed. Yeah, we cannot. It's it's uh, always dangerous to group everybody and with one paint, with one brush. But I don't think the Democrats, even the Thursday and Friday, were happy because everybody realized this is going to be a stretch for a meaningful indictment. Mr. Schultz? Yeah, I, I think the, uh, the way I would describe this is it's the same kind of stuff that Donald Trump has done in, in Manhattan and in New York for many, many years. Stuff being miscategorized. For example, the payment that Michael Cohen made to not only Ms. Daniels, but to another person whose name escapes me right now, um, were not recorded in the in the organization's records as hush money to porn star, which is what it was. Okay, they were recorded as attorney fees. Okay, and then they grossed the number up. Cohen got for that hundred and thirty thousand and hundred and fifty thousand that they paid Ms. McDougal, which is what two eighty. He got $420,000 from the Trump organization. Isn't that what lawyers do? Well, uh, law-abiding lawyers do not advise their clients to misrecord it as legal expenses when, in fact, it's a settlement. Okay? That, that's, that's a problem. That settlement's not tax-deductible, for example. Your your bad behavior that you cover up with cash. It you depends can't take on that how off. you invoiced it, though, doesn't it? I mean, he, well, no, Trump's it just paying a bill. You, you're the you're the lawyer. <laughs> no, you send depends. him a bill. He's just paying the bill. Actually, they had meetings where they talked about how they were going to do this. But mm -hmm. what allegedly? makes it a felony? Yeah, uh, allegedly Cohen and Weisselberg will both testify to it. I think. Oh, the but, liar, the the <laughs> compulsive liar. We're going to take his word. Okay. And the guy in Rikers Island, okay. both of whom were chosen for life by mm -hmm. Donald Trump. But in any event, the way it becomes a felony. And this is fascinating, and that's why it's not very clear from the indictment, is that you use that fraudulent document that you made, attorney fees, to, uh, to cover up another crime. And that what's wrong with this indictment, in my view, as a 
person who's just curious, is it doesn't lay that out very clearly what the other crime was. And I think in some of the 34 cases, it's a different other crime than it was in other of the 34 indictments. Well, he hasn't said what the other crime is yet, has he? It, not in every single case. Some of them, there you can, can intuit it a little bit. Uh, for example, New York State, like all states, has a tax code. And, you know, if he deducted those attorney fees that were hush money from his New York State tax return, that's a felony if he covered it up by this initial thing. That makes this whole thing a New York State felony. And so it's not easy, but how do I want to say this? For many years, New York had a problem with the mob. Rudy Giuliani came along in the Southern District of New York, and man, everybody got arrested. And they had all kinds of laws to get those guys with. These are the same laws that they're getting Donald Trump with. The exact same laws. He's just not what we think of when we watch The Godfather as, as a mobster. But it's the same sort of very technical hush-hush meetings, big amounts of cash, and all of a sudden it comes off somebody's taxes or, I don't know if this is true, they used campaign funds, uh, which would mean it's not a business expense in any sense. Well, I think so. that's what he one of the things they're alleging is he should have used campaign funds, that this, this was money to further his campaign and to make him look better, and that he should have used campaign funds. Um, I would disagree with that. This should never have been used for campaign funds. Um, if you're going to pay hush money, it doesn't matter whether you're running for office or not you're you're keeping not just the the public from knowing you you're keeping your your spouse from knowing so i i don't know i think it's all a stretch um and a reach for this this prosecuting attorney it's it's going to be interesting to see because it's just exactly the kind of stretch that organized criminal operations do all the time and they have specific laws in New York because they know they do it. And so they make it illegal so they can come back and get them. I don't know if it's going to work or not, but it's fascinating. And it's very New York. And New York ignored Donald Trump's behavior for an awful long time in all of our lives. For 40 years, he never got in any serious trouble. But a lot of the stuff he did, I mean, if you were a contractor on one of those hotels who never got paid... And then you go back and look, and I think there was some of this. He had deducted the amount he didn't pay them from, or he'd, he'd added it to the cost of the valuation of the building, even though he never paid the contractor. There's that kind of stuff that Donald Trump has done for many, many years and seldom faced any real issues. Mr. Carl. Well, uh, first of all, the, the, to compare this with the previous case we talked about, the civil case, remember there's a... a, a institutional constitutional uh, presumption of innocence that favors uh, the president uh, trump and and the convoluted theory i haven't read <laughs> the, the the indictment uh, like larry does but but it, it, the, the more comp the, the more that presumption of innocence and the requirement of proof of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt uh, rather than just a mere presumption of evidence, all of that uh, makes this a highly unlikely conviction. Plus all the appeal op options that that a criminal defendant has. So uh, it, it's just a. I, I, I've got another spin on it, but that's that's my separate issue. <laughs> it, it, it is going to be true that some of these invoices that'll be going into his accountant's hands will be for legal fees. <laughs> he's not, yeah, yeah. not going to be paying hush money and having to call it legal fees. These will be actual lawyers getting this money. Yeah. So. All right. We'll go uh, back to you, Mike Hite, for the final word. Did you get Joe for ready? Yeah, we got Joe at the beginning. I'm sorry. Yep. I'm, sorry. Uh, I, I'm just going to go back to the fact where I think this is this uh, came out to be a whole lot of nothing. It, it's nothing that we didn't already know. <laughs> Um, it's nothing that other prosecutors could have prosecuted a long time ago, and they saw there was nothing to it, and that's why they didn't bring the charges, uh, you know, years ago. So this particular 
uh, DA ran on uh, the fact that he was going to indict Trump. That was his whole campaign. I'm going to indict Trump. So that's what makes this so political. And I think there are a lot of people, so a lot of these are tried in, in the, in the you know, public realm. Um, I think a lot of people see this as just political and nothing really will come of this. Uh, it'll be a dud. Um, now, Joe will tell you there's there's stuff going on in, in Georgia. We'll get to the Georgia stuff when we get to the Georgia stuff. This one's going to be a dud. And because it's going to be a dud, I think it's going to be uh, it's going to favor uh, Donald Trump in his run for the presidency. He has joined the three I club twice impeached, once indicted. That's a very small club. Yep. <laughs> issue, issue number five. We go to you, Mike Carl, for the anchor leg. Uh, playing off of uh, issue number four, uh, I, I'm suggesting that one of the, if not the major. Given all these concerns and questions about about this particular indictment, uh, reasons why it went forward is to take attention away from the desire, the disaster that is the Biden administration. I think that is why the you know the big time national level Democrats are are not all concerned about this or or not. Uh, uh, you're worried about the the not resulting in conviction. I think it's just because it takes away from the disaster that is that is the Biden administration and in 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 crime, uh, it, you know, the border, uh, the economy. Uh, so to me, it's it's you know, and I may be a little cynical about that, but but uh, and the and the you know the case in Georgia will have the same same effect. So that, that maybe that's why they're stretched out and it's being staged, uh, even though it it and it's clearly uh, is drawing a lot of Trump, you know, impassioning a lot of Trump supporters. Uh, it, it it at least avoids the uh, exposure and and the concentration on what's going on with the Biden administration. So is your is your question is this part of a Democratic conspiracy to keep yeah. attention off of Biden? Well said. Yeah, that's what I was. Intended. Again, do not try this at home, folks. I'm a licensed professional <laughs> talk show. That's right. Host. You get paid for this, and I don't. <laughs> uh, let's uh, compare W-2s at some point along the way, Mike, and see how I'm doing. <laughs> All right. When I think about uh, people who can root out a Democratic conspiracy, I think of Larry Schultz first. Um, I, I don't believe it's a conspiracy. I think that there are lots of us, um, I have said for many years, that after all the good work they did cleaning up the mob in New York, there were some very um, interesting situations that they utterly ignored. And Donald Trump's never been charged with a crime before. And for a very long time, it appears that the evidence is that there were dealings that were less than forthright uh, on his part in the building of his giant real estate empire uh, in Manhattan, in the building of the various buildings. I mean, he is still, in my mind, the only guy who ever went bankrupt running a casino. So, <laughs> <laughs> Bill, Stubble, <There's... laughs> Bill Stubblefield, go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to go back. Le to... Leave him wanting more. <laughs> leave him behind. Right? Yeah, I'm going to go back to the issue that I raised earlier about the two-party system. Uh, I think we've gotten to the stage that anything that we do not like about the other party, we invoke conspiracy or we invoke uh, uh, arguments that uh, we've gotten away from the facts. And I think that's equally true on both sides of the party. All right, Michael Height. Um, I'm going to say to Larry's point that, that Donald has done this for a long time and never been convicted. And Donald came out in his first campaign and told you why um, he's been able to do this and, and nothing's ever happened is because he donated tons and tons of money to both parties. You know, you want to talk about transparency? How many politicians come out and tell you that? That's exactly why nothing has happened. And you have to have the evidence. It gets covered up. Doesn't get covered up. I don't know. But he's been able to escape prosecution all these years. So I think he's going to escape prosecution this time as well. Um, I, I don't know that I would go so far that say this is a conspiracy. However, one does have to question the timing of these 
these sort of things. And the timing of this particular one was after he announced he was running for president. But at the same time, like I said before, Bragg has said all along, I'm going to indict Trump. I'm going to indict Trump. And, and that's what he was going, whether he had substance or not, um, he was he was going to indict Trump for something, and I think he went searching for anything he could find. I've heard even rumors that, that Joe Biden has said, come on, man, there's nothing here. Mr. Ferretti, take us to the bridge. Yeah, well, well Mike Heist correct. Uh, Donald Trump has admitted to uh, why he's never been in trouble before. In fact, he was one of the biggest donors to District Attorney Morgenthau, who was the predecessor to Alvin Bragg, who, who is the current district attorney uh, in New York. Uh, and, and for years, uh, the DA's office looked the other way on some of Trump's dealings. Uh, so that's correct, Mike. And, and uh, But I'll tell you, to, to Mike Carl's point that this is an overarching Democratic plot to steer direction away from Joe Biden, if the Democrats, the National Democrats, had their druthers this New York case would have never been filed first. Never. Uh, the, the reports are that Alvin Bragg was under a lot of pressure internally. In fact, he had an assistant DA resign and write a book while Alvin Bragg was uh, dithering around with this, this case. Fifteen and seconds, book, Joe. The book was critical of Bragg for not bringing this case. So I think the pressure was internal, not a national Democratic plot. And on that note... In honor of Larry Schultz invoking the movie The Godfather, we'll theme it out with this one, baby. Take it to the, the break. And remember, you've got uh, eight seconds for your uh, final thoughts. We'll get to right after we do these. Go for ready via telephone. Not a good look for the Tennessee legislature. Larry Schultz. It is possible to run for president from a prison cell. Eugene V. Debs did it while <laughs> resident in Moundsville, West Virginia, in a federal penitentiary in 1920. Bills, double field. Get out and enjoy the beauty of spring. And Mr. Carl. Since none of the responders defended the Biden administration, the strategy is working. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Height. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the reason for the season. It's not about Easter bunnies and, and eggs. Dave Ramsey's show is coming up next. This is Talk Radio, WNR Martinsburg and uh, TV 10. Have a happy Easter.